right, good to see you out this morning. And uh, let's get on back into 1 Peter chapter number 1. If you got your Bibles, we'll jump back into 1 Peter chapter 1. And just like normal, we'll pick up where we left off and go next verse, next passage, next chapter. Which we won't get to next chapter this morning, but we will get to next verse, hopefully. Uh, while you turn to 1 Peter, let me say how much I surely do appreciate. And I'll mention it again uh, in the 11 o'clock service so that everybody can hear. But I really, really appreciate Brother Mike and Miss Rita Hyatt and them taking uh, our seniors out yesterday. And I've had so many people come up and tell me how much they enjoyed time of fellowship, whether it was putt-putt golf or at Keaton's uh, Chicken up there. Um, talking to several people they'd never eaten at Keaton's before. And like I told them, I said, it ain't much to look at, but you won't eat no better chicken on the face of the planet. And uh, I like them kind of places. I like, I like the places that maybe the health department doesn't visit all the time. Amen. <laughs> But the, but, the food's, but the food's amazing. That's the places I like. Y'all know I'm a sucker for haps up there, and every time you walk into haps, don't ever look up at the return vent when you walk into haps. Don't ever look up at the return vent. It, 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 if you ain't got a strong constitution, it'll turn your stomach. The return vent looks like it has not been cleaned or changed since the place opened. But you ain't going to get a better hot dog than over there at haps. Amen. And it's like that at Keaton's, man. It's good, good chicken. And I appreciate Brother Mike and Miss Rita and their willingness to have some time of fellowship with our seniors and everybody. And uh, if you went, I know you enjoyed it. And if you did go, please make sure you tell them how much you appreciate them taking time out of their schedule to have some fellowship and uh, just a good time of Christian fellowship. All right, 1 Peter in chapter number 1 this morning. We've been looking at several different aspects of salvation in ch uh, chapter 1 of 1 Peter. We looked at the blessings of salvation, covered that extensively, and then we looked at the burdens last week of salvation, burdens of trials of faith, seasons of heaviness. That's in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. But this morning, we started just kind of bumped it last week, but we'll look at the beholdings of salvation, looking at the fact that the Old Testament prophets beheld it, kind of seen it, saw it afar off. The Bible says in Hebrews, kind of like this, it says in Hebrews that those Old Testament saints saw what we have afar off, but, but they weren't able necessarily to obtain to it. They didn't, wasn't able to grab a hold of it. It wasn't time for it yet. And, um, and the, what's what Paul or Peter's fixing to talk about in verses 10, 11, and 12 is that these Old Testament saints, these prophets, they prophesied of it. They wrote about it. The Holy Ghost spoke through them, but they never really actually, uh, obviously, weren't in the body of Christ. There wasn't no body yet to get into. His body hadn't even been broken yet. There was no New Testament church to get into. There was not even a New Testament yet. The Bible says a testament is, is of no force while the testator is alive. For the testament to really come into effect, there has to be the death of the testator, according to Hebrews. And so anyways, we'll look at these beholdings here. Uh, we'll start in verse 10. We kind of just bumped this last week, and we'll say a few more things extensively about it. Verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Uh, even though they prophesied about it, they didn't partake in it. Even though they inquired about it, they didn't experience it. And even though they searched it, they just could not see it. And we looked at some of those pictures in the Old Testament, like Isaiah 53, wonderful picture of New Testament salvation in the Old Testament. Um, go to Romans chapter 4. I, I made a reference to this, but didn't turn there with you last week. But go to Romans 4, and these are a, a couple of beautiful pictures about New Testament salvation in the Old Testament that Paul talks about in Romans chapter number 4. He talks about Abraham, and he talks about David. Paul uses Abraham and David as examples of this. Uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse number 1, Romans 4, 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Verse, chapter 4, verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. Obviously, Abraham is prior to the law. Abraham gets his justification just like you do. He got it by believing God. Now, he wasn't believing the same thing I'm believing, but he just believed what God said. 
will find what he believed. Verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What did he believe? Well, if you go back to Genesis, you'll find what Abraham is believing is this. God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you seed as the stars of the heaven, children as the sand of the seashore. And the Bible says Abraham just believes him. I mean, Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90, and God tells Abraham, I'm going to do this, Abraham, give you this many kids out of a womb that's dead and an old man that shouldn't be able to have children. And God said, Abraham, you believe that? And Abraham said, God, if you said it, that settles it. I believe it, God. Well, Abe, if you're crazy enough to believe that, I'll just give you my righteousness, imputed righteousness. And that's a picture of us because God tells people in this age, he tells people this, do you believe that I sent my son from heaven that God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on in the world, received up in the glory, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Do you believe that I sent my son born of a virgin? A virgin, never happened before. Do you believe I sent my son born of a virgin without the help of the seed of a man and that man lived 33 years of sinless life and then he died on a cross and his blood shed was enough to cover your sin and then do you believe that guy three days later got up from the grave and lives that's the gospel first Corinthians 15 Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures he was buried and he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures you believe that God looks at man and says would you put your faith and trust in that that nothing else is good enough to get you to heaven but believing that and the man says yes Lord I believe it all right if you're crazy enough to believe it, here's my righteousness. I'll put you in my family. You can have my imputed righteousness. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Abraham's a picture of this. And then David's a picture of it as well. Look down at verse number um, 6. Verse 6. Even as David, Romans 4, 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Why is David writing this? Why does David, and, and it's written over in Psalm 32, if you want to go look at the cross reference in Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2, David is writing the blessedness of God, giving a man righteousness without that man bringing a sacrifice for it, without him working for it. Why does David say this? Is it because he's looking forward to the cross and he has perfect knowledge that God is going to send his son to die for sins? No, that's not it. Do you know why David's writing that? Because David has committed a sin which there is no work that can make that sin uh, be covered or forgiven. What's his sin? You know his sin. His sin was with Bathsheba in the matter of adultery and in the matter of murder. Killed a man uh, and took his wife. Do y'all realize when you read Leviticus... You read the law books, especially Leviticus, that's where most of those laws are found at, ceremonial, moral, and otherwise. But when you read about that over there, do you realize there's no work that can be done, no sacrifice that can be brought to the temple, no lamb, ram, bullock, turtle dove, nothing. There is nothing that can be given for the sins of murder and adultery. There's not a, there's not a sacrifice for it. And yet David does them both, and David says, I didn't have nothing I could do to work this off, to bring a lamb, to bring a ram. As a matter of fact, David says himself in Psalm 53, he said, sacrifice and burnt offering thou desirest not, else would I give it. He said, you don't even want me to bring a sacrifice for this because there wasn't one for it. But David obtained something no other Old Testament saint really understood a lot about, and that's God just granting a man righteousness, covering his sins and imputing it to him without him having to do anything. All those Old Testament saints had to do something to see their sins remitted, covered, rolled over from one year to the next. The Bible talks about in Hebrews when they would bring those sacrifices, there was a remembrance of those sins yearly. Every year they'd have to keep sacrificing, keep putting blood on that 
mercy seat. Keep going to that brazen altar. Why? Because their sins were never fully forgiven, gone. They just come back up yearly. But David said, I'm a blessed man because God has covered my sin and given me his righteousness when I did not deserve it. Y'all, that's us. That's all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. I should spend eternity in hell for my sin. That's my wages. But I ain't gonna. As a matter of fact, when God sees me, he, when God looks at Cody Zorn, he does not see a sinner. I'll tell you what he sees. He sees his son. The Bible says, Beloved, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I'm his son. When he sees me, he sees me like he would see Jesus Christ because I'm in Christ. Now, I realize practically, on a practical basis, uh, practically, I still sin. I still have to be judged for those sins. God deals with me, though, as with a son, not as a sinner. But positionally, Positionally, I got what David's talking about here. My iniquities are forgiven, my sins are covered, and God will not impute sin to me. Why? Because instead he imputed it to Jesus Christ. God took all of my sin, stuck it on the back of Jesus Christ on Calvary, and Isaiah 53, Old Testament, prophesied in the New Testament, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord took all that, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. <laughs> he took all of it for me. So, I mean, we see all that in the Old Testament. It's, it's, a, it's a picture, a shadow, a type. We're going to preach on one of those pictures of New Testament salvation in the Old Testament this morning. I, the, I'll be honest with you. I, one, of the, one of the things I enjoy preaching on more than probably anything else, and I've got a pile of messages on it, I guess what a man enjoys preaching on or really kind of he gets stuck on, he preaches more on than anything else. And when I go back and look through my sermons, I guess I have more sermons on Old Testament pictures of New Testament salvation probably than any other subject in my sermon sermon barrel or sermon book or whatever. All them old, I love preaching on that stuff. Looking at them Old Testament pictures and then seeing Jesus and old dirty rotten sinners in them and how Jesus reconciles, redeems, restores, and puts sinners in the family. I love that stuff. I do. Anyways, let's go back to our text here. Still looking at the beholdings of salvation. Uh, watch this next verse. This is a great verse talking about these Old Testament saints. Verse 11. Uh, 1 Peter 1.11, searching what? Talking about the prophets they were searching. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it, the Spirit of Christ, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. According to verse 11, the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of Christ, would come on them and even to a certain degree according to this, in them simply to the extent that they would speak the truth. Now, obviously, when you read John and you read the New Testament, you cannot come away but believing the fact that those Old Testament saints, they were not sealed with the Spirit like we are. They didn't have the Holy Ghost indwelling them as far as sealing them unto the day of redemption, coming in them and never leaving it was even David that prayed the prayer in Psalm 53 again when he'd committed his sin. He prayed, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's a prayer that no New Testament church age saint has to pray. Amen. Do you realize, I don't care, if you're saved by grace, if you've been born again, I don't care how messed up you get, and Christians can get some more kind of messed up. I mean, I'm telling you, there ain't, listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. There is no sin that you committed before you got saved that you are not capable of committing after you get saved if you just let your flesh run wild. You just let yourself get away from the book and get away from the church and get away from Bible preaching and get off your knees and you just let your mind and your life start doing what it wants to do. Any sin you did before you got saved, your old dirty flesh is still highly capable after you get saved. 
I think that's why some, a lot, and tonight I'm going to preach a message on uh, dealing with assurance of salvation. Why so many Christians struggle with having assurance of salvation. Um, and, and it kind of goes along with what I'm saying right here. I think the reason why so many Christians struggle with it is they end up committing a sin after they got saved and, they, and the devil comes along and says this, there's no way you could be saved and do what you just did. There is no way you could be saved and say what you just said. Saved people don't talk like that. There's no way you could have thought what you just thought because saved people don't think like that. And so all of a sudden you say, I need to go get saved. And maybe it's not you need to go get saved. Maybe it's just you need to start digging a little deeper in consecration. Just walk with God. And when it happens, get it under the blood. Confess it. Forsake it. Walk with God. Listen to what I'm going to tell you, and I'm telling you I've seen it in my life and anybody else's life. In 12 years of evangelism, I've seen this stuff over and over and over again. Nothing, and I mean nothing, will make a Christian doubt their salvation any more than living in sin. Sin in a Christian's life, not walking close to the Lord that saved them, it will make you get to the place where you're like, I, no way I can be saved. And the devil will capitalize on it because he'll keep you like this. He loves me, loves me not. I'm in, I'm out. So, so anyways, the, the, obviously we understand the Spirit of Christ was not in them like he's in us. We never have to pray the prayer, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. If you're saved, you're sealed until the day of redemption. Till he comes and redeems your vile body. Makes it like he is. You, you got him. Which should make us want to live all the more holy. Because anything you look at, the Holy Ghost is having to look at it. Anything you say, the Holy Ghost is inside of you. Anything you hear, anything you think, <laughs> he knows it. So, I mean, you, 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 it, it's predicated on us to make sure that we try and keep a holy temple because the Holy Ghost lives inside of it. So, anyways, I kind of got off topic there, but here it said the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Matter of fact, look what, look what Peter says about this in 2 Peter. Go to the very next book, 2 Peter chapter 1. And verse 20, 2 Peter 1, 20. As, as far as what was the Holy Ghost doing inside of these prophets when they wrote Scripture, he was speaking through them. 2 Peter 1, 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. In other words, what was written down was not just the will of the human penman. It wasn't just, well, Moses just wrote down whatever it is that come to his old head. Well, Joel just wrote down whatever it is come to his mind. Jonah just wrote down whatever it is he could recollect about his story. No, 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 no. It was not the will of man that this stuff was written down. It's deeper than that. But holy men of God, I like my King James Bible, if you pick up almost, almost any other version, do you realize they take out that word holy right there? They just say, but men of God. No, it's holy men of God. Somebody's got an aversion to people being holy. But it ain't the Holy Ghost and it ain't the King James Bible. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And notice it didn't say that they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, even though some did. But you realize that we got a lot of books in our Bible to where the man who, who has the name for bearing the book or whatever, uh, he didn't necessarily write it, he dictated it. And as he was speaking, the Holy Ghost was speaking through him. There's all kind of books you can read that Paul wrote that the Bible even says on the postscript at the end that it was, it was written by Timothy or it was written by Lucas or it was written by, you know, so in other words, Paul spoke it and they wrote it down. But while Paul's speaking, he's speaking under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You find that in Jeremiah too. Jeremiah in one point, the Bible says that, that the, I forget who it was, but there was a scribe that wrote the words that came out of Jeremiah's mouth. So it ain't just about writing. It's also they would speak it and God would get in it. But they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And, and notice back in our text, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and watch what it says here. 
I, I got so many more references I could run where even the authors, David admits it, um, Paul admits it, so many people that write scripture say that the Holy Ghost spake by me, that they were under inspiration when they wrote what they were writing down. But watch what it says here. Watch what they saw. Watch what the Old Testament prophets beheld. It said that the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand. Watch what was coming through them. Watch what they were testifying. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now time out. Time out. The sufferings of Christ, that's the cross. That's him dying on the cross. The Old Testament prophets saw a Messiah, saw him being slain. But do you know what they saw directly after that? What is the glory that should follow? That's Revelation 19. That's when he sits on the throne for 1,000 years as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now I'm fixing to show it to you. When you read your Old Testament, I'm going to show it to you over and over. When you read your Old Testament, what you'll find is this. The Old Testament prophets wrote about his sufferings and his ruling and reigning many times in the same verse. They never did write about the church age. They didn't see it. It was in types and shadows, veiled references. They never wrote directly about the church age. They didn't see it. In other words, Clarence Larkin, an old writer from the late 1800s, early 1900s, he's got one of the best books on the subject of, of dispensations and things like that, and it's called Dispensational Truth. And it's got a bunch of charts in there. His charts are just, they, they, he was way ahead of his time. Anyways, but the way he told about it was like this. He said, and I like the way he describes it, he said that the Old Testament prophets, they only saw the mountain peaks of prophecy. In other words, they stood on a mountain peak and they looked out and they saw Mount Calvary. They saw that. And then they looked beyond that and they could see Mount Zion when Jesus rules and reigns. But this is what they didn't see. Down over here is the valley of the church age of which we've now been in for 2,000 years. And they didn't see that. They, we're nestled down here in a valley and they saw over the top of us. Now we're now looking back and we see all the pictures. We see the types and shadows. But according to Paul, the mystery of the church, the body of Christ, it was a mystery hidden in God. The Old Testament saints didn't see it. All they saw was sufferings and glory. Death and glory. That's all they saw. Matter of fact, let me show it to you. Go to the Old Testament. Look at, um, uh, we'll start in Isaiah. We'll give you a quick one here in Isaiah and then we'll look at several others. Look at Isaiah in chapter 9. This is a Christmas passage. Isaiah chapter 9 is a good Christmas package about the, uh, a passage, excuse me, about the child being born, the son being given. Look at Isaiah 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. Watch what old Isaiah says, one of the great Old Testament prophets. For unto us a child is born. Now where did that happen at? Bethlehem. child was born in Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given. God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Where did the son get given? The son was given on the cross. So the child's born in the, in the manger in Bethlehem. And then he grows up and the son is given for the sins of the world on the cross. But watch the very next part. So there's your sufferings, and then watch the glory. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Y'all, the child was born in Bethlehem. 33 years later, the son was given at Calvary, and then there is a colon right there, and immediately it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That ain't happened yet. When does that happen? After the rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, and then the king comes back to rule and reign. But all Isaiah saw was birth, death, glory, all together, separated by a colon. 
There is 2,000 years. Man, that book will mess you up. It will. I think the Holy Ghost does it on purpose to mess people up that are not honest. If you're honest and the book's your teacher, you don't got to worry about getting messed up. But if you're dishonest and you want to be, you know, the corrector of the book, the Lord will let you. If you want to trip, stumble over the book and break your neck and fall off into hell, God will let you do it. Knock yourself out. But if you come to that book with an honest, honest heart and say, Lord, I'm not the teacher, it's the teacher. I'm not the judge, the book's the judge. Lord, you, you, then the Lord will, you know, he'll have mercy on you and show you some things. So Isaiah 9 shows us that. Let's look at another one. Look at Isaiah 61. Look at Isaiah 61 with me. And it's all through this Old Testament. I'm going to show it to you multiple times here. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Time out. Stop right there for a minute. Do you know who preached that message in the New Testament? Jesus. It's in Luke chapter 4. The very first message that you find Jesus preaching publicly in his public earthly ministry, he walks into the synagogue, he picks up the scroll of Isaiah... It's in Luke 4, and he stands up and he reads what you just read. Jesus Christ in his first coming stood right up and preached what you just read. But that ain't all. Look at what the prophet keeps saying about it. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise uh, for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. They shall build the old waste, raise up the former desolations. That's talking about him building the new temple in the millennial reign. And you keep coming down through here and all what you're reading in Psalm, or Isaiah 61 is you're reading about Jesus Christ sitting on the throne ruling and reigning. But he starts out talking about the very first message Jesus preaches and then immediately shifts to, and he's going to wipe everybody out that don't agree with him. The year of vengeance is on the way. Them Old Testament prophets, all they saw was sufferings and glory. They didn't see what you and I currently enjoy right now. The valley of the church age. Let's look at another one. Go to Zechariah, the next to the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah. Um, go to the very end of Malachi and come back to the left. Zechariah in chapter 9. Watch Zechariah 9. This is a good one. This, this one really probably is one of the best ones. This really highlights what I'm talking about. What the prophets beheld and what they couldn't behold. What they saw and what they didn't see. Zechariah 9 verse 9. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, uh, a colt the foal of an ass. Time out. When did he do that? Palm Sunday. You, you, somebody said it back there. That's the triumphal entry. He comes riding in on the lowly ass and the colt, which was the child, the foal of the ass. Now watch the very next verse. I'm not talking about 10 verses later, 20 verses later. I mean the very next verse. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he, the same guy that just come riding in, shall speak peace unto the heathen and his, the same guy that just rode in on the, on the colt. His dominion shall be from sea even to sea. And from the river, even to the ends of the earth. So on and so forth. <laughs> this, all that I, all Zechariah sees, he sees, yeah, ah, there he comes, riding on the donkey. And yep, right after that, he's sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning. I could show it to you over and over. It's in the book of Psalms. Psalm 22, verses 1 through 28. Almost the entire chapter of Psalm 22 highlights what I'm saying. Psalm 22 starts off by saying this. Psalm 22, 1 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Who said that and where did they say it at? Jesus said it on the cross. But you know what you read directly after that? Directly after that, you start reading about him wiping his enemies out and sitting on his throne. You don't read anything about where we're at right now. That's why so many people don't believe in a literal, physical, visible rule and reign of Jesus Christ for 1,000 years on planet Earth. Because they think, well, that Old Testament prophecy of the crucifixion and him riding into town and all that, that was fulfilled. So the rest of this must be fulfilled. No. Do you know why the rest of it hadn't been fulfilled yet? And I don't, I don't want to get into something that's, that's, that this is so, what I'm fixing to say could be so protracted. I could spend a month of Sunday schools going on what I'm fixing to say. So just take it or leave it. I'm thinking to say something that could go so many different directions, and this really is a subject for Bible Institute because this gets really involved. But listen to what I'm fixing to say. The first coming could have been the second coming. Now just marinate on that for a minute. You say, that don't even make sense. It does. The first coming could have been the second coming if, if, if. Israel would have received their king. Here's what your Bible says in Matthew chapter 11 talking about the kingdom of heaven. We've talked with you some about the difference in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is always a literal, earthly, visible, physical kingdom on earth. The kingdom of God is within you according to Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is not righteousness, is not meat and drink. It's not physical, visible, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven. He said, and from, he said, all the law and the prophets were until John. He said, and from that time till this, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And then Jesus says this, and if ye will receive it. Receive what? The kingdom, the king. And if you will receive it, John the Baptist was Elias, which was for to come. Y'all, I like to say this is way too protracted to get into, but when you get into Revelation, Rome is on the throne. That's the, the whore on seven hills. That's Rome. Who was in power when Jesus came the first time? Rome. The man of sin is going to be in power when Jesus comes to rule and reign. Well, the man of sin was right there. He was called the son of perdition, and he went to his own place, and his name is Judas Iscariot. He's the counterfeit Christ. I, I mean, it, it was all set up for the first coming to be the second coming. But it didn't happen. Why? Because in Acts chapter 7, so they, he had to die. We saw the picture of that. But the rule was going to come right after that. So in Acts chapter number 1, after he had already died, been buried and rose again, the apostles look at him in Acts chapter 1, just as he's about to ascend, and they say, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom to Israel? You, you're still the king, right? We read all them prophecies. Sufferings and glory, sufferings and glory. Where to glory? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father's put in my hand. You just go be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth. And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, here's their last chance. Here's their last chance. Acts chapter 7, Stephen stands up in front of the council of the elders of Israel. And he takes them all the way back to Abraham and Mesopotamia. And he walks them all the way through their history. And he says, you've killed your king. You crucified him. You put him to death. You've not received, you've received the, the law by the disposition of angels. And you've not kept it. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. Anybody would like to receive Christ. <laughs> and, and he gets a wonderful response. They all rush him and they gnash on him with their teeth. And the Bible says, Stephen looks up. And according to your King James Bible... My Savior right now is seated at the right hand of the Father. Ain't that what your Bible says? That's what my Bible says. It said he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But that's not how Stephen saw him. The Bible said he looked up into heaven and he said, I see the Son of... How do you, if, let me say, hang on a minute. I don't want to misquote this because if he says what I think he said right here real fast, then that even gives you more of a tip off. Uh... uh yeah, I got it right. Verse 56, I see heavens open and the Son of Man. Y'all, time out. The Son of Man is never a reference to Jesus and the church. Never, never, never. It is always a reference to Jesus and Israel. Son of Man, because he's the Son of Israel. He's the Son of a man. He, it tied him back to his physical lineage.
And he looks at them Jews and he says, I see the Son of Man standing. What's he doing? He's fitting to come back, Revelation 19. He's fixing to come back and end the whole... He's coming back to set his kingdom up right now. No church age. No church age? No. Nothing had even been written about a church age yet. Paul hadn't even been saved yet. That don't even happen until two chapters later, Acts 9. Wouldn't have been no need for a church age. It would went right off into the kingdom. Because that's everything the Old Testament prophesied. Sufferings and glory, sufferings and glory. No church age involved. Would have been no need for it. He'd have come back right then. If Israel would have dropped to their knees and said, Oh my God, we have crucified and killed our Messiah. You know what would have happened? The prophecy in Zechariah would have come to pass just like this. He would have come back and they would have said, Where'd you get them wounds in your hands and your feet? And he'd have said, Got them in the house of my friends. It would have, it would have all fell in line right there. But you know what they did? They stoned Stephen, rejected their king. And you know what happens in Acts chapter 8? You can't make this stuff up. That's the wildest book on the face of the planet. Acts chapter 8, Philip leaves a Jewish meeting, runs off in the desert, and a black Gentile gets born again by grace through faith. And then in Acts chapter 9, the apostle to the Gentiles gets saved. And then in Acts chapter 10, God sends Peter to the Gentiles in Cornelius' house. And from after Acts chapter 7, God says, All right, Paul's on the Jews. Do you know what we've been living in now for 2,000 plus years? God has said, pause. And it ain't messed God's plan up one bit. God can pause it and start it and stop it whenever he wants to. We're talking about a God that can, over in Joshua, can make the sun stop moving around the orbit of the earth. Ever how all that works to make the sun stand still. You think it messes God up? I mean, a day with the Lord's is a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years in one day. You think this has really messed God's plan up? You don't know my God. And so God has pressed pause, and God has sent a gospel by grace through faith plus nothing minus nothing to the Gentiles, and that's where we're living right now. But as soon as the church gets raptured out, Revelation chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, as soon as the church gets raptured out, God's going to say unpause, and he's going to go right back to dealing with them Jews because they crucified their Messiah, and he's going to come right back to dealing with them just like he was already dealing with them, and then going to come back and rule and reign over the house of David just like he said he was going to. Now, I know that's heavy, and that could take a whole long time, but there it is. Take some of that and study that out, man. That's, um, that's, that's Bible truth that you won't hear a lot of hardly anywhere. Anyways, all right, back to 1 Peter chapter 1. It said, They signified the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Verse 12. Verse 12. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves... But unto us they did minister the things. When it says it was revealed, not that they necessarily understood it, but God just used them as the instruments to put it down, to reveal it, put it on paper. Because they didn't even get the ministry of it. Look what it says, that not unto themselves. In other words, to a certain degree, they didn't even, it wasn't revealed. They didn't understand it. All they did was write it down. But unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire uh, to look into. Here we find, even though the Old Testament prophets wrote it down and recorded it, they didn't get the benefits of his sufferings like we do. It has ministered to us. It was just something they wrote down and didn't have perfect knowledge of. But you and I, Brother, it's ministered to us. How did it minister to us? Changed us. Totally changed us. I don't read where any Old Testament prophet got totally revolutionized and changed because they heard about a king coming to die on a cross and getting raised three days later. But I'll tell you this, I read all in the New Testament where people heard that message and it changed them radically. Flipped their life upside down. That's what it done for us. It it ministered to us. And then here's a little verse that we just dealt with in Institute here the other day, kind of bumped it, and there's all kind of implications here. Look at the last part of verse 12. Uh, speaking of this salvation, these things that were hidden in the Old Testament, which things the angels desire to look into. 
Do you realize you got something that angelic beings wish they understood and could partake in? Now, I don't know to what it, you say, why do the angels desire to look into what we got? Now, this is what I told our fellows over there the other night. And maybe you, you come to me and help me with some of this. This is the best I can give you on it. The only reason that I can say the angels desire to look into it is the Bible says there's a group of angels that fail, left their first estate, Jude 6, Jude 6, kept not their first estate and they're reserved in chains under darkness. You know who they are. That's the sons of God in Genesis 6. They came and cohabited with the daughters of men. They had giants, mighty men of old, men of renown. God locked them up and put them in chains. And the Bible said they were called sons of God. And I quoted this verse to you a minute ago. Behold, now are we the sons of God. We got a title they had. So I, now I want you to understand something. I want to make a real clear statement. A real clear statement. I do not believe angels can be redeemed. I don't believe God died for angels. I believe Jesus died for sinners. I don't believe angels can be redeemed. I don't believe angels can be saved, born again. I don't believe that. I don't believe there's any verse of Scripture to, that proves it or testifies to it. But I will say this. If I was one of them sons of God that had messed up and fell, and all of a sudden I heard about a group of people that they had messed up and fell because of Adam in Genesis 3, and then God redeemed them, restored them, and put them in the family and called them sons of God, I'd be checking it out real close to see if there was any way I could get in on it. <laughs> Wouldn't you? That's the only thing I can give you on that because it says one day we, you and I, one day we shall, 2 Corinthians 6, we shall judge angels. The replacement sons of God are going to judge them fallen sons of God at the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20. And so evidently them angels are desiring to look into it because they're like, man, I don't believe there's no hope for them. But if I was one of them, I'd be looking into it too. Don't take what you got for granted. There are angelic beings that wish they could get in on what you got. Don't take that for granted. It's awesome what we got. God's been good to us. Which things the angels desire to look into? I'm not even going to try and start in verse number 13. We've seen the beholdings here and the blessings of salvation, birds of salvation, these beholdings of salvation. And so I'm not even going to start on the behavior of salvation, but that's where we're going next. Verses 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Now he deals with because we have been saved, because we have been partakers of all of this prophecy written down and all these blessings, how should we act? That's what I love about my Bible. This Bible, it, 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 it shifts so fast, but it's a blessing. So on one aspect, this Bible for the last... I don't know, five or six verses has just been straight doctrinal application. Not a lot of practical stuff. Just telling us some deep doctrinal truths. Angels desiring to look into what we got. Prophets prophesying of the sufferings of Christ, glory that should follow. Uh, deep doctrinal truths about what they knew and what they didn't know. And then all of a sudden, he stops and says, all right, in light of all that, this is how you ought to be acting on a day-to-day -day basis. In light of all that, let me tell you how you ought to be acting on your job, how you ought to be acting at home, how you ought to be living out here in this world. He, he shifts real quickly from deep doctrine to just straight practical application. So there's always something for everyone to get a hold of when you're reading this book. And so next week we'll start looking at the behavior of salvation. How should we behave because we've been saved? Let's just read verse 13. And just to kind of give you an idea, and we'll, we'll, we'll close here. He said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he tells us we're to be obedient children, so on and so forth. And we'll pick this up next week. I, I really thought I was going to get farther into that, that thing about sufferings and glory. Got me hung up. So, all right, let's pray and we'll, we'll get back started on that next week. Father, thank you so much for your word. Help us, Lord, to uh, study it for ourselves. God, how important it must be if prophets searched it, inquired about it, diligently sought it out, and yet they were not partakers and couldn't even see it in a full picture. And Lord, how important this book must be if angels desire to look into it and still can't get a grasp on it. And here we sit with Bibles that sit on our coffee tables or up in the windows of our car and collect dust and the sun 
warps the covers and dries out the leather and God we don't even read it or mark in it or Lord that never took time to go through it forgive us Lord I, I imagine angelic beings must watch us and our lackadaisical uh, attitude and approach to the scriptures and think what are you doing what are you doing I'd give anything if I could partake in it and understand it like you do I think prophets uh, in glory must look down at the apathy of our generation toward the scriptures and say, what are you doing? We would have given anything if we could have understood the Bible like you understand it now. And, and we don't read it and we don't heed it and we don't live it. God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Lord, help us to love it more. If we've never read it through, help us, Lord, each and every one of us to commit today that we're going to start searching this book finding the truths of God that can change our life and our homes and speak to our souls. God, we'll thank you for it now. Bless you people. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here this morning lost without Christ, they ain't never been born again, today would be a great day to see somebody get saved. I pray they'd come running to Jesus. Lord, we'll thank you for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're dismissed right there.